Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Officio Assassinorum miniseries. But before we get into the goodies today, I have been reliably informed by every single TV commercial, by every single internet ad, and every single pamphlet ruthlessly crammed into my mailbox that it is indeed Black Friday thing going on. Except it's no longer a day, it's apparently several weeks. And so, in keeping with the holiday spirit, I have merchandise to push. A new mug inspired by the Oxygen Not Included LP showing an adorable little colony manager that has finally seen the light and the way. The only correct way of running an asteroid colony, of course. And also a new shirt starring Lord Mobility Scooter from Total War Warhammer 2, enacting his very own solution to the Lustrian Skaven problem. And of course, there is also a discount code. Enter HOLIDAY20 when prompted and receive a 20% discount on your order. I guess all that's left then is to say thank you, America for bringing this thing to my shores. All of those commercial leaflets make for excellent kindling in my fireplace, now that we're entering into frostbite season once again. And so, with the shilling complete, let us move on to the start of today's show, the ever so slightly disturbed Eversaur Assassin. And I think I'll start out this video simply by listing you some of the different meanings of Eversaur in Latin. Destroyer, Overthrower, Overturner, Obliterator, Exterminator. And frankly, I feel as if I could wrap the video up right there and you'd already have a pretty damn good gist of what an Eversword Assassin is and, even more importantly, what he does. But hey, you don't come to my channel for bare bones basics, you come for deeply detailed lore debauchery of the most verbose and graphic form. And so that is what I will try to deliver once again. Normally I would start with the training, but ever sort of assassins are not trained, they are born. Nay, not born, crafted. By a most vengeful, petty and malicious deity. For you see, the ideal candidates for recruitment and further perfecting via the Eversaw program are young children who possess a comprehensive registry of mental disorders, preferably of the destructive variant. For whilst these youthful devil spawns would normally provide the Imperium with nothing but problems and vandalization, the Eversaw program provides these misguided rapscallions with a fun and productive alternative that aids rather than damages the Imperium. And they'll take this alternative whether they want to or not. Come to think of it, perhaps it would be more correct to say that the candidates in question are captured rather than recruited. Well, let us not get caught up in such trifling details. For at the end of the day, whether they volunteered or got volunteered, the end result is much the same. So how do you create an episode assassin if you can't train one? Now, I'm sure that someone somewhere has at some point in time been crazy enough to try and train one, but um, once the various chemical cocktails get rolling, that option flies out the window. Along with the kitchen sink, half the interior, and presumably the trainer himself, at this point in a much reduced state compared to when he embarked upon this ill-advised course of action. For an Eversaur assassin is not trained, he is de facto programmed. The Eversaur Temple utilizes the same kind of hypnotic indoctrination technology that the Eversaur Temple uses, although to a much greater degree, whereas the Eversaur utilizes this technology to introduce certain concepts and knowledge to the mind of the assassin, such as how wind might affect a projectile, how to operate his weapon more effectively, how to utilize various forms of improvised weaponry, and so on and so on, for the Eversaur, they pretty much teach him absolutely everything he needs to know through this process. 
And if you remember in the Eversaw video, I mentioned that whilst this is a very effective and efficient way of teaching someone to do something, it occasionally skips a beat. For example, it may teach you how to fix a broken power line, whilst neglecting to inform you that you had best turn off the electricity first. Which is why the Eversaw Temple utilises this technology as another layer in the overall training process, where the assassin still has to demonstrate that he fully understands the lessons taught to him via hypno-indoctrination before his education can be considered fully complete. Whereas in the case of an Eversaw assassin, well, you don't exactly give those tests, so uh, your only real option there is to pray that it worked out well on this particular occasion. And in most cases, it does work, and when it does work, it works very well indeed. It allows the Eversaw to be taught all of the various skills he requires, like the basic operating procedures of his weaponry, how to change the magazine in his executioner pistol, how to activate and deactivate the force field in his power sword, and of course, how to best utilize these weapons, along with a wide array of other, more improvised forms of weaponry. That last part being by far the most complex, it is relatively easy to simply create a berserk killer. It is considerably more difficult to make that berserk killer actually effective. No matter how much combat stims you pump into the average person, if all he then does is run screaming towards the enemy, who in all due likelihood possesses a wide variety of automatic weaponry, then he is unlikely to achieve much more than providing the scenery with a bright new coat of carmine paint. And likewise, you could give the average slob on the street access to the most advanced weaponry imaginable, but that does not mean that he would be able to utilize it effectively, or hell, even just operate it. So an Eversaw assassin needs more than just unbelievable levels of rage and loathing fury, he requires unbelievable levels of rage and loathing fury that can be directed. Vital difference. And via the application of hypno-indoctrination technology, not only can the Eversword Assassin be taught how to best operate his weaponry and equipment, he can also be taught about the nature of his target. This is done just before the deployment of the Eversaw. All available up-to-date information will be fed directly into the operative's brain. What his primary victim looks like, what secondary targets look like, where they can be found, the layout of their location, building schematics, street plans, of course defences, how many guards, where are they, what are they armed with, how to counter those weapons, and how to use them against the enemy. Who else lives in the building? Family? Civilians? Workers? Other similar soft targets? And in some, very rare cases, the assassin may also be fed information on targets to be spared and or avoided. Although such circumstances are rare, and even when they exist, the hiccups inherent in hypnotic technology leaves quite a bit of potential for accidental dismembering. And finally, of course, potential exit routes and recovery points, so that the Eversword Assassin may be placed back in cryogenic stasis and unleashed upon another target in the future. This level of programming allows the Imperium to unleash the massive spiked ball of ravenous ass rape that is the Eversaw on a target, on a specific target, and contain his rampage to a roughly generalized area. Even let them recover the mean little bastard afterwards. And what could possibly be better? But why are the Eversaw so angry in the first place? We haven't covered that yet, have we? Well, Beyond the obvious, the multitude of psychotic disorders, of course, a prospective Eversaw is put through an extensive program of enhancive surgeries. And it all starts with the subject's brain. This is where the fundament for all the future work is laid. Utilizing a tried and tested method of cracking open a human skull, the Magos Biologist implants the victim. <clears throat> 
subject brain with small cogitator chips capable of receiving, processing, and sending data. This eases the hypno-indoctrination technology's effect and also allows the officio to gather information about a mission's outcome directly from the operative's brain. This is a rather useful function since getting an after-action report from an Eversaw can be challenging at the best of times. And even when one can be verbally acquired, it rarely goes beyond the levels of I killed the first dude with a wooden toy horse, and then his buddy by ramming the broken half of the first fellow's legs up his asshole, and so on and so on. Heavy on the grisly details, but light on actual information. Come to think of it, I imagine there must be a series of severely traumatized officio workers somewhere in the hallowed halls of the Assassinarum who has to actually watch the recordings and uncover those details. Huh. That might score pretty high up on the worst job in 40k ranking. But of course that is neither here nor there. The cogitated chips can also be used, of course, in reverse, by feeding information into the subject's mind. This is utilised in the way that we already talked about by giving him access to information about the target's location, his appearance and defences and so on, but it is also used to set up a series of triggers in the assassin's mind. For example, when he kills a target that has been marked as an enemy, a guard or a primary target, it will release a flood of endorphins making him literally feel pleasure whenever he kills. But should the Eversword Assassin deviate from his programming or his chosen path, then the Cogitator Chips may instead choose to stimulate his pain centre, providing an immediate, overwhelming and unignorable reminder that the Assassin had best get back on course. A secondary effect of this part of the programming is also further enhancing the assassin's rage and anger by continuously giving him little pokes every minute of every hour of every day until he has finally hunted down and killed his correct target. Imagine being on a very, very long and dull drive as there is a small child sitting in the seat behind you, repeatedly poking you straight in the ribs with a plasticky toy thing. That might simulate a thousandth of a percentage of the amount of annoyance deliberately introduced to the mind of an Eversword assassin, so as to make sure that he really, really, really does not like whoever it is he has been programmed to molest. And the final set of cogitator chips that need installing within the assassin's mind uh, is those controlling the assassin's biological functions. Not only his basic biological functions, but also all of the wonderful additives that will be installed later on. The average Eversword assassin is de facto a walking, talking drugstore, or, well, to be more precise, a walking, growling drugstore, pumped so full of various additives and artificial sweeteners that if they were to be pumped into a system willy-nilly, it would quite literally result in the immediate and extraordinarily messy death of the operative. And additionally, certain situations require certain combat stimulants. For example, if he is engaged in a long-term chase having to run down a car on the motherfucking highway, then something that increases his speed and agility might be beneficial. Whereas if he has been just dumped into a massive ballroom filled with people that are all in need of liquidation, then something that increases strength and violence might be more appropriate. Now, of course, an Eversword assassin is not exactly the most level-headed of individuals, and making minute tweaks to the chemical balance of his body is probably far beyond his uh, range of mental capabilities 99.8% of the time. This is why this is further programmed into his mind via hypnotic indoctrination, so that the assassin does not have to think about every single combination of drugs for every single scenario. He can manually adjust the dosage should he feel it necessary, but most of the time this will be done automatically via subconscious implants. These hypnotically introduced 
de facto scripts are also used to regulate various other portions of the assassin's body. For example, the next introduced in the enhancing process would be the counter glands. These need installing immediately after the lobo chips and cortex implants, because the counter gland is designed to pump various anti-venoms and antibodies into and throughout the Eversword assassin's body. And this is not to counteract external poisons, like somebody shooting him full of toxic needles for example, the counter glands are instead designed to make up for the fact that most of the combat drugs pumped into the Eversword assassin's body body are actually outright lethal to any unmodified human, and it is the counter glands responsibility to ensure that regardless of how debilitating the effects of the toxic substances pumped into the assassin's body may be, he still remains operative, at least for the duration of the mission. The next implant is a secondary heart. This allows both for the assassin to remain operative should his primary one be smushed, but it also increases the flow of blood throughout his body, allowing for the quicker dissemination of the various counter substances produced by the counter glands, and of course also the easier dissemination of the things the counter glands are designed to counteract. And now that we are finished installing all of the basic things, the things made to ensure that the Eversword Assassin does not simply self-destruct, we can get to the more extensive and interesting parts of the enhancement process. First and foremost, the installation of additional adrenal ducts for… <laughs> blindingly obvious reasons. This is followed by a series of muscular enhancing procedures, increasing both muscle density and growth well beyond the regular human norms. This is done partially via various chemical components, surgeries and stimulus, but also via an extensive training program. This all has to be done before the truly fascinating implants begin. At this point in the process, all he has to increase aggression is his various cortex implants. These reward the operative with rushes of endorphin when he does something correct, and punishes him with surges of pain when he does something incorrect. In this early stage, this is used to encourage his training regime, rewarding him when he is training effectively, punishing him when he is slacking off, and running him through various training programs designed not only to enhance his muscle growth, but also to test out the various functions of his enhanced biology. This allows the temple to make sure that his counter glands are operating correctly, somewhat crucial since if they don't the operative will simply keel over dead. It also allows them to check that his programming is functioning as it should, that he is able to operate his weaponry, that he is able to reload it, that he is able to reassemble it, repair it, that he can run through various combat simulations, and that his cortex implants are also functioning correctly, releasing endorphins when he does a good thing, and releasing pain when he does a bad thing, cause well, if those are switched around, things are about to get real interesting in the temple's corridors. And finally, once all of the tests have been run and passed, and the assassin has grown to a suitably bulky level, the final series of modifications can be made. Over the course of presumably weeks if not months of careful and extensive surgical procedures, the Eversol's body is riddled with subdermal pockets and containers of drugs and chemicals that can be deployed into his body via muscular reactions. But some particularly potent mixers are too… effective to store directly within the operative's own flesh, and are instead contained within his armoured bodysuit and delivered via a series of injection ports directly into the assassin's bloodstream. When properly combined and monitored, these chemicals enhance virtually every single aspect of the Eversaw. His speed, his strength, his senses and even his mental faculties, allowing him to think and act inhumanly fast, perceiving the world around him as if in slow motion, allowing the Eversword Assassin to quite literally dodge bullets. When incorrectly combined, or monitored in a flawed fashion, it results in the rather immediate and embarrassing death of the operative, which is why the temples go through an extensive testing procedure before deploying an Eversword Assassin. 
And at the last, when all the procedures have been completed and the Eversor is more a pharmaceutical experiment than man, he is placed in a chemically induced coma and equipped very carefully by a multitude of exceedingly nervous tech adepts with his armored body glove, his weapons, and of course his signature skull helmet, fitted with a comprehensive suite of sensors and monitoring equipment. This, by the way, is by far the most dangerous part of the whole exercise, for right now the Eversaur is, for all intents and purposes, fully operational, but, crucially, devoid of the programming that is supposed to, theoretically, allow him to tell friend from foe. A misstep or accident at this point in the procedure is going to have very comprehensive and very messy consequences. Especially since the very last thing that would have been installed on the Eversword Assassin is something called the Terminus Gland. As the somewhat foreboding name might already suggest, this is a last stand suicide mechanism that might allow an Eversword assassin to take its target with him even should the target be able to kill the Eversword assassin. The Terminus Gland is stored deep within the Eversaur's body, ensuring that the accidental loss or destruction of his body glove cannot prevent it from being deployed. And once it is opened up, the various chemical cocktails inside of the gland combine into a most horrific cocktail that is then rushed through the assassin's body, turning his very blood and flesh into a super oxygenated, combustible state and with a final little spark from the terminus gland, detonates the assassin like a hundred kilogram high explosive warhead. And I don't care how well protected the target may be, there ain't nothing in the vicinity surviving that kind of an exit. But assuming no bumbling laboratory apprentice manages to drop the vicious mass murderer on his head whilst transporting him, the Eversaur Assassin will be placed within cryogenic stasis, where he will be kept until a target can be found. And targets. That's the interesting part that makes the Eversaur so very different from the Calidus or the Vindicar or, well, pretty much any other form of assassin. The Eversaur resembles nothing so much as a fucking artillery strike. There is nothing subtle about his deployment, there is no carefully guided precision or long-term secretive masquerade or a pretense of surreptitious undercover activities. No, he is simply just deployed to the target much like any other orbital ordnance. A temple vessel will sneak its way into the system equipped with a huge variety of stealth augmenting arrays and then fired at the plant in question via drop pod, after which the operative is left more or less to his own devices until either he or everything around him is left decidedly deceased. To put it somewhat bluntly, it is the scorched earth approach to assassination, where it is not so much the destruction of a target as an area that is required. For example, let us say that an entire planet has seceded from the Emperor's Light, led by a major wealthy clan of ideologically inspired lunatics that think that democracy or freedom are worthwhile values in the 41st millennium. Deploy an Eversort assassin to the top of whichever hive they live in, and after the screaming eventually at long last stops, the rest of the populace will wander up to discover every single hive high and mighty idealistic noble, determinately dismembered by a vitriolic vandal satan with a frankly disheartening degree of creative thinking. And surely, after finding the planter governor impaled ass first upon a water garden pleasure statue to the point where a little angelic figure is protruding from its oral cavity while still pissing a stream of strangely pinkish licking froth, the rest of the populace will swiftly come to the conclusion that independent thought is a remarkably hazardous state of mind, and return to the warm, embracing and forgiving bosom of the Imperium of Man, who may or may not then force the entire populace into exile on a penal colony. And as an added bonus, 
Every single nearby solar system with a functional Voxlink will also think twice before trying their own hands at sedition. For you see, whilst other assassins may strike with consummate stealth and secrecy, the Eversword assassin is everything but. It is a statement, and a clear and concise warning from the Imperium of Man that it sees everything, it knows everything, and it is not at all afraid of reacting appropriately when required to do so. Another favoured application of an Eversword assassin is essentially in lieu of a full-scale exterminatus action. For example, if a planet has suffered badly from an infiltrating cult of gene stealers. That is a very unfortunate circumstance, a circumstance from which very few planets can really be saved. We're talking full-scale active uprisings, raging across the streets all the months before such a situation is a virtual certainty. This of course also counts equally as much for Chaos Cultists, and if the Imperium had time, they might instead employ a Calidus Assassin to very slowly and carefully infiltrate the cult, killing only its top leadership and possibly even taking command of the cult to ensure it self-destructs. But if there's only weeks or months, or maybe it is even just too late already, then such roundabout actions are no longer an option. The deployment of an Eversword Assassin gives the Imperium one last chance to try and root out and destroy the cult before it becomes a major threat to the entirety of the Imperium. If this can be done before it launches into a full-scale uprising, then perfect. If it can only be destroyed after the plant has been lost, well, at least it has limited the damage somewhat. As long as in the end the Eversword Assassin's mission is successful, he will have saved the Imperium a great deal of trouble, and the need to deploy full-scale Imperial Guard forces. Additionally, when it comes to rooting out cults, depending upon how advanced the cult in question may be, it could also be seen as necessary to deploy multiple Eversword Assassins at once. If the cult is still in hiding, but the Imperium has a good enough understanding of its rough location, say for example if it is located entirely within one major hive city, or in one region of a planet for example, then an Eversaw can be dropped into the local area and simply told to go wild. With his advanced censoring equipment, he is able to root out gene stealer cults, even those who still appear as humans, and he will have no scruples about killing innocents just in case. After all, that person over there may look like a normal human, he may even for all intents and purposes appear to be and maybe even actually be a normal human. But he could also be a gene stealer. Better safe than sorry. Of course, as you can probably imagine, such a purge can take quite a long time. Even an Eversword Assassin can only kill so quickly, and depending upon the size of the cult and how thorough the Assassin's programming has been, it can take weeks or even months before he's fully done exterminating all of those who need exterminating. And it is of course entirely possible as well that once the assassin has been deployed on target, he discovers intelligence that suggests that the problem is larger than first anticipated. Whereas the Inquisition might think, oh well, we have uncovered a, a local cell of heretics, a couple hundred individuals at most. But after the assassin has ripped the spinal column out of heretic number 255, he may start asking himself some questions. Hmm, there still seems to be quite a lot of people in strange robes needing deadening. Perhaps this is a more extensive issue than first anticipated. Naturally, the Eversaw won't actually care about that fact, he might report it if he's feeling particularly bright and cooperative on that evening, but otherwise he will simply just keep going, until he runs out of target or until one of them gets lucky and blows his head off, and then gets evaporated in turn as the assassin transforms into a mushroom cloud. 
But on those occasions where the threat is deemed to be large enough to warrant the deployment of several Eversword assassins, well, not all that much really changes. It's not like they're going to be doing any kind of overly advanced teamwork. It's more along the lines of, instead of shooting someone with a shotgun, you instead find yourself a cannon, loaded up with grape shot, and then fire that at the poor unfortunate sod instead. Pretty much the same effect, just on a uh, wider scale. But of course, the Eversword is not only deployed against targets within the Imperium, they are also occasionally utilized against external targets, in those cases where mass destruction is required. Against larger concentrations of Xeno's beings, for example, or deployed against certain races that are more difficult to liquidate. Orcs is one of them. You could snipe an orc warlord, and hell, it'd probably be relatively easy as well. But making sure that the big green brute is actually dead might require more of a hands-on approach. Preferably chopping him up into fist-sized chunks, just to make absolutely certain that he won't be orking about any further. Eversword assassins also work very well when deployed against high-value targets in an active war zone. If they manage to get to their target and take care of them, then, well, lovely. A high-value commander, a strategic asset, a headquarters structure, stuff like that. And even if they don't manage to get it all the way to their target, you can be absolutely damn certain that they'll be causing quite the ruckus on their way there and a well-placed Eversword assassin can be worth far more than entire regiments of Imperial Guards or other conventional forces, both in the actual killing of the targets and in the sheer chaos, destruction and terror left behind in their wake. And finally, let us have a look at the Eversword assassin's weaponry and equipment. Decided to leave this for last this time because honestly, the Eversaw's weaponry isn't that special. It's the Eversaw himself that is the greatest part of the weapon in this particular case. He is equipped with an Executioner Pistol. This is a combination of a standard but higher capacity magazined bolt pistol, firing smaller bolt rounds, not the full Astartes bad boys. It also has a secondary weapon attachment, a so-called needler. As the weapon's name so clearly suggests, it fires tiny darts, essentially hypodermic needles filled with a concentrated form of neurotoxin. When they hit a target, they inject it with this neurotoxin, ensuring a rapid, yet nevertheless exceptionally painful death. This gives the Eversword Assassin access to both an armor-piercing weapon in the form of the mass-reactive bolt rounds and a weapon deadly against soft-skinned targets in the very same gun. Additionally, the weapon is set up so that it can be fired almost simultaneously, where the higher muscle velocity of the bolt round ensures the enemy's armor will be cracked and compromised by the time the needle round arrives giving it a very effective 1-2 death punch even against large armoured targets. For the next weapon, the Eversword is also equipped with a Neuro Gauntlet. Continuing the Neurotoxin theme, this gauntlet is one where each finger is tipped with a long hyper-alloy claw, more than capable of rending apart most armour and certainly any soft tissue it might interact with. And, as a coup de grace, in case the Eversword Assassin is engaged with something too large and nasty to die by simply being torn into shreds, each one of the claws is also connected to a large vial of pressurized neurotoxin, allowing the Eversword Assassin to pump his target full of the vicious poison. That should be more than enough to take down anything short of a great demon. And finally, the Eversword Assassin carries, of course, a power sword, but 
that kind of stuff is regular by assassin standards, and melter bombs. Just in case the assassination targets get their hands on some heavy ordnance, we can't have the assassin's rampage stopped just because the enemy has access to a few tanks after all. That would kind of defeat the entire purpose of an Eversword assassin, wouldn't it? After all, they're supposed to be unstoppable tools of terror and mass destruction. We can't have all of that halter just because of a few metal boxes, now can we? And upon the conclusion of aforementioned Rampage, assuming the Eversword assassin is still alive, which actually happens quite frequently, considering the sheer amount of augmetics poured into them, they are damn difficult to kill, and whilst the odd Eversaur may require a little bit of uh, both biological and mechanical repair on occasion, they do quite often actually manage to make it back home. After being retrieved, the assassin is placed back into cryogenic stasis. This is both to control his more um, extreme urges, and also to allow the assassin to actually, you know, live. The toll that the chemical cocktail takes upon the assassin's body is a heavy one indeed, and if kept outside of cryogenic suspension, it would be an extraordinarily lucky and tough operative that would be able to sustain more than two or three years of active service. Though there are those out there who are far more skilled in manipulating their own biology than most Eversaurs, who are able to minimize the negative effects of the drug cocktail and could potentially keep themselves alive for damn near eternity. There are also those individuals who, again, are able to manage their own bodies to a far greater degree than most other Eversword assassins. Some of them are even able to operate more or less normally within Imperial society, although in those cases they have usually been granted special dispensation to not undergo the full extent of the Eversword transformation process. Because whilst much can be said for a blood-maddened killer monstrosity, there are occasions where one with a little bit more in the way of mental faculties can also be useful. And with that, I will wrap up this, the third video in the Officio Assassinorum series. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then... Have a good day.